look at John, the 18th chapter, and welcome everybody to the house of God. You know, preaching on Easter, there, there's so much, so much to say on Easter. There's so much. It's, it's such a big educational resource full of, of words that, you know, all the Gospels have every, every recognition of Jesus Christ. Everything that they saw, Luke, Matthew, Mark, John, they all wrote some powerful things about Jesus. They were there, so we had, they have first class information, so we're getting it from them. So we believe, how many people believe the Word of God, right? When I read it, I got up early this morning just to read it. I couldn't stop reading all the Gospels, just going back and forth. And, and I told the Lord, I said, Lord, this is so much. There's so much here, Lord, that we can spend the whole day. And uh, I said, Lord, you know, what I've learned, what I've read this morning, you bring it out. I don't want to come as A, B, C, 1, 2, 3 sermon. I want to come just to let the Lord minister to us as he would, right? And, and I just yield myself to him in Scripture, and, and uh, I want him to minister. But let's look. Let's look before going to the cross and after the cross. It's so important. There's little things that we need to see. Let's look at John. The Bible says, and, and uh, in John the 18th chapter, we're there already, verses 1, hallelujah, it says in Jesus, Jesus, the Bible says, and when Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples over the brook Cedron, where was a garden into the which he entered and his disciples. And Judas also, which betrayed him, knew the place, for Jesus oftentimes reported thither with his disciples. Judas, then having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, cometh thither with lanterns and torches and weapons. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth and said unto them, Who seek? ye let's stop here for a moment jesus knew why they were there but i believe he had to say who seek thee and he jesus never did or said anything that only but only what his father told him to say jesus never said anything that was contrary to what god said and he says whom seek ye they answered him jesus of nazareth jesus said unto him them i am he or in the Hebrew is, I am. Now remember that word, I am. Do you remember where we first heard that? When Moses went to Pharaoh, and, and Moses asked Jesus, God, God, what do I say if they ask me who I am? He says, say, I am. We hear the word, I am, throughout the Bible. Whenever we hear, I am, God speaking, this is God speaking to these men. Now notice this, the band of men that came. Look at it again in verse in verse 3, the band of men and officers of the chief. I want you to understand something. This was anywhere from 300 to 500 men that came at night to Jesus. Now, the movies show you a few people coming. But here were 300 to 500 men. You know why 300 and 500 men came to arrest Jesus? Because Judas knew that there's no way they would be able to arrest this man. There's no way. And in fact, Judas knew that they would never take Jesus because Judas, as long as he had the 30 pieces of silver in his pocket, he knew he had it, even though they would never arrest this man. Because you remember, Jesus, every time he talked about the Father, there was threats of stoning Jesus. You remember the stories where there were threats that people would stone him and they could not stone him. The Bible says that Jesus would just disappear in the midst of them, just walk in the midst of crowds. So there was no way that people could harm Jesus. There was no way that no one could harm. So Judas says, you know what? You're going after a powerful man. You're going after a man that did miracles that God hears and God respects and God honors him. There's no way. So you're going to have to be prepared to put up a fight. The Bible says 300 to 500 men. And the Bible says, and they were armed. That tells you that their deal was to go 
And their plan was to arrest Jesus, but if they had to kill Jesus, which they never would, if they tried to, if they had to kill the disciples, they were up to this, at this moment, to bring a slaughter. But notice this. When Jesus said, who do you seek? He had to say this. He had to say this. He said, whom do you seek? And, and, and he said, they said, we seek Jesus of Nazareth. He said, I am he. And listen to this. Verse 6, as soon then as he said them unto them, I am he, they went back and fell to the ground. Three to five hundred men fell out in the power of God. Now think about the power that was in that garden. The power that was released when he said, I am, wham, they all fell out. See, there was no way they could have taken Jesus. But he offered himself willingly. The Bible says that he told Peter, he said, Peter, listen, I could have I drummed God to bring legions and legions of angels to protect me. Now think about how many legions. What is one legion? What is a legion of angels? What is a legion of angels? What is a legion? 6,000. Six and he says, I can drum up more than 6,000 angels. And we find out the power that there was, right? But notice this. They fell out in the power of God. Think about where that power went. That power just did not stay there. It went. It went throughout the garden. For the Bible says, look at Mark the 15th chapter. Let's look at Mark the 15th chapter. This is something that we overlook when we think about the power that was there in that garden. Mark the 26th chapter. Hallelujah. Amen. Oh, excuse me. Uh, 14. Excuse me. 14. Mark 14. I'm getting excited here. Hallelujah. Amen. The Bible says in verse 51, Oh, Jesus, Jesus is so good. Jesus is so good. Say with me, hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. The Bible says that in verse 50, they all forsook him and fled. The disciples forsook Jesus at that very moment. This is after Peter cut the ear of one of the men there. And there followed him, verse 51, there followed him a certain young man having a linen cloth cast about his naked body. And the young man laid upon him. And the man and the men laid upon him. And he left the linen cloth and fled from them naked. And they led Jesus away to the high priest. With him were assembled all the chief priests and the elders and the scribes. Now let's look at this young boy. Where did this young boy come from? Where, why was this boy naked with a linen? Why was this boy ever found when the men tried to gather this boy? The Bible says that he slipped through. Some translations say he slipped through and ran. Let me tell you something. This is the power that was in that garden. Some theologians say the power that was on Jesus when he said, I am, I am. That boy may have been buried that very minute. That boy had may, may have been buried that very morning. That boy was there. And when he said, I am, think about when the soldiers fell back. They fell back and that same power that was released from Jesus saying, I am, went and it zeroed in onto a grave. And we find this little boy. You see, you see, no other gospel do you find this. But only Mark. Why do you find Mark? Because Mark, theologian, says Mark was in this area when they arrested Jesus. And he was ready. Think about it. He was ready to run. The Bible says they fled. They fled. Listen, they left Jesus all alone as he was being arrested. So they got to see a frame of a young boy. They got to see a part of a picture frame of a resurrected boy that was resurrected from that moment on. You see, the power that was in Jesus. They, see, there's no way they can arrest him. There's no way that they can handle him. There was no way. But he did it voluntarily because he knew he had to do what he had to do in the next few hours. Isn't that amazing? We see this. I want you to see something. Go with me to Philippians now. Philippians, the second chapter. Hallelujah. We find the power that was given to Jesus at that very moment. Listen, when Jesus gave himself over, 
He knew what he was doing. There was purpose in everything he did. Everything that Jesus did had purpose. To this point, there's purpose. We're going to be resurrected with Jesus. There's purpose for what he did. He just wasn't a man that preached the gospel, healed many, and was killed on the cross and put in a grave, and all of a sudden was taken by the Jewish or, or the military and hid among other caves. No, this is a story that is so different about a person that died and was resurrected. This is Jesus Christ, right? Notice what it says in Philippians, the second chapter. We find in verse 7, uh, uh, in verse 7 it says, but made himself of no reputation. This is Jesus. And took upon him the form of a servant. Listen, this is Jesus became your servant. And he was made in the likeness of man. He, being found in fashion as a man, humbled himself and became obedient unto the Pharisees, no. Unto the Roman soldiers, no. Unto the things around him, no. He became obedient unto the death. Even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name. Look at that word, him. Given, God has given his name to Jesus. Now think about it. Not only a name, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, or Yeshua, Mashiach, but God gave him his name. Think about it. God. We find that at this very moment, he became the God of man. He became the God of man. And here we have this Jesus now that has a name. I want you to think about this. And I told this to my son-in-law yesterday. We had, we just had a great time. We went to Tulsa to pick up some parts and, and for his car. And we just had a great time of talking about Jesus. And I told my son-in-law, I said, I said, I want you to think about something. Seated in heaven, you have a man. Seated in the Trinity, you have a man. A man that came to the earth from heaven. A man that had to leave all his dignity, all his power, all his kingship. A man that had to leave and was, was coming to the earth, born through a virgin Mary, mother, you know that story, and yet became the sacrifice for all mankind. All mankind. You know, you say, well, he was the son of God. No, no, at this time he was just a man. 32 years old, a man that knew that God called him to the earth to do things for the kingdom of God. Here on earth, he walked the earth. He walked the Middle East. He was there in Jerusalem. He was born there. Hallelujah. This man now takes his body to the cross because God demanded this of him. And yet this man now is in the Trinity. A man that represents you in the Trinity. No other man can do that. No other man can ever do that. You couldn't took what Jesus took on the cross. Every sin, every sickness, every disease known to mankind, every hurt, every depression, everything that happens to mankind, at one moment, it all came upon him on the cross the weight of the world came upon him. The Bible says the weight came upon him so strong that even God hesitated to look at his son because he saw the sin of the world because his son that was pure now has become full of all sickness. Think about it. What, what man can do that? Oh, uh, this morning we had so much to do to get this church ready. Uh, everybody was busy and we all had pressures and we all had sweats and we all had things going. And, and I told my wife, oh man, but think about what Jesus did. Nothing compared to what he did. Nothing compared when we feel like it's just too much to handle the ministry or the things of God or or even the little things, you know, even the children or even the uh, the worship or whatever it may be, even if we're called to, to do something in the church, oh, it's, it's well worth it because think about what he did for us, right? He went to the innermost part of the earth. And at the innermost part of the earth, when he gave up his ghost, the Bible says that he took the keys of death, 
hell, and the grave. I want you to think about that for a moment. Can a man ever enter the gates of, of hell? Can the, a man ever enter into the... The Bible says that he told the, the disciples that I will enter into the belly of the earth and I will be there three days and three nights. Think about a man that was on the cross and immediately was taken immediately by his power into the depth of the earth, the depths of the earth, to deal with Satan, to deal with his cohorts, not only to deal with them, but to release all those that were in this separation, what we call paradise, release all these people. Abraham was there. Moses was there. Oh, King David was there. Oh, Jesus, he did this, he did this, and he released them. Think about the power that was in hell. Think about the devil when he saw Jesus. Think about the devils that are, that are in the pit of hell right now when they saw this man coming to the hell, the belly of the earth, and finding that he takes authority. The Bible says he took dominion and authority and power. He took the keys from Satan. Satan thought he had it. See, Satan took it, the authority from Adam. Satan took the authority from Adam and he tried to give it to Jesus when Jesus first entered into the ministry. Jesus went to the desert 40 days and 40 nights and Satan came to tempt him. And one time he told Jesus, Jesus, I'll give you this that was given to me. You know what he was telling Jesus? Jesus, I'll give you what I took from Adam. That's why he's called the second Adam. The second Adam came to replace what the first Adam lost. And so now he's this second Adam now that has authority. And now when he resurrected, is seated at the right hand of our Father. But now we, listen church, we, the church here on earth, are a representation of Jesus here on earth. Come on church, can you say amen? I am a representative of Jesus here on earth. What Jesus did, and he's seated at the right hand of the Father, ever making intercession for me. He's making intercession for you. He's cheering on the church. Today he's saying, yes, the church is worshiping me. The church is glorifying me for what I did. Think about it. We are that church of the firstborn, which is Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Amen. I don't know, but things like this get me excited. Things like this. I, I, I couldn't be like the world where they don't, they, they, they replace the resurrection with the bunny rabbit. You know, uh, there's nothing wrong with children having a festival, gathering eggs, but that's not the purpose. That's not the purpose. Bunny rabbit, give me a bunny rabbit. I cook it over open fire. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> I'll enjoy Easter with Jesus eating a rabbit. Hallelujah. Amen. People, uh, the world doesn't understand it. And yet the church enters sometimes in those arenas where they forget the reason for Easter and they focus more on the big ear bunny rabbit, you see. Now look at this. I want you to look at Matthew 26. Let's look at Matthew 26 now. Oh, he's so good. Hallelujah. Amen. He's so good. What he did for us. Oh, Jesus. Hallelujah. Matthew 26. Notice what it says here. In chapter 26, verse 67. Thank you, Father, for speaking to us. Verse 67 says that they did... They spit in his face. This is our master. They spit in his face. They buffeted him. Others smote him with the palms of their hands. Verse 66, they were ridiculed and saying, Prophesy unto us, thou Christ. Who is he that smote thee? And notice this. At this very moment, that was the beginning. That was the beginning of what would come. The smiting and the spitting, the slapping of hands were ridiculed. These were pharisaical. These were, these were the, the doctors of the law. These were the teachers of that day, the religious teachers of the day. The Bible says they spit on them. I notice some translation, if you look deeper, it was over a hundred people 
that were in that room, a hundred Pharisees, a hundred leaders of the religious church at that time, they, they were there humiliating the Father. They were there hurting Him. They were there hating Him. The, but the thing that I want to tell you, they were playing charades with Him. This is, this is our Father. This is Jesus at this very moment. But do you know the Bible says that He opened not His mouth? You know why I believe he opened out his mouth? Because the same thing could have happened at the garden when he said, I am he. They would have just fell out in the power of God. He could have easily called angels to defend him at that very moment. But notice this. Listen to this. They smote him. They slapped him. They played charades with him. And they spit on him. You know, to spit on a person, especially a Jewish, a Jewish man, to spit on a Jewish man or any person, it's a high crime. But see, they knew that they had the law in, with them. They knew that they had the justification, they thought. So here, they're playing with him. The Bible says here very clearly that he took this. The palm of your hands. Listen to this. Later on, we find that it was the palms but later on became the fist. Listen, having palms slapped you is degrading enough, but now having a fist beat you and beat you and beat you. You know, we look at the paintings of Jesus on the cross and it's like a little, little piece of blood, just a little stream of blood coming down. You know, or you know how they depict Jesus on the cross. The Bible says that Isaiah that there was no form in this man. You could not know who he was. The beating was so, so, so evil that literally pieces of his face were falling off. Now you think about that. You know, I don't grow a beard and I can't. But if I have long hair and I try shaving with a dull blade, it pulls a hair, it pulls one hair, and it hurts. I don't know. Guys, have you ever pulled your beard just, just to... Maybe you get a bug in it and you, you pull it and you feel it. I want you to think about it. They got Jesus and they filled their hand with his beard. And they pulled it. You know, the purpose of pulling the beard was not to just make him hurt. The purpose of the beard was to pull his face off. And this is what was happening to Jesus. And so we find out that here we see this. The, 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 go with me to Luke 22 now. Luke 22. Let, let's, just, let's just walk. There's so much. That's what I told the Lord this morning. Jesus, there's so much here, God. There's so much here, and it's all powerful. All your disciples did a great job telling us. But I want you to minister to us the way you want us to, Lord. We want to see this. We want to see this. In Luke 22, verse, verse 63, says, Peter went out and wept bitterly, and the men that held Jesus mocked him and smote him. And when they had blindfolded him, they struck him on the face, asked him, saying, Prophesy, who is it that smote thee? And many other things, blasphemous, spake they against him. Notice what it says that they blindfolded him now. Here Jesus is, is in the blind now. He doesn't know what is coming at him now. I don't know about you, but I want to see something come at me so that I can lease duck. So here they blindfolded him. Now they're ridiculing him. This, this is what he did. This is a brutal beating. But it wasn't by the laymen. It was by the leaders of those days. It was not laymen of a back corner street that are drunk. These are educated religious law givers that assimilate themselves together to do this crime unto Jesus. And I think about those things. I remember in Houston now. Uh, I, I saw a police pull over a young man, a big man, and the young policeman couldn't bring him down, try to arrest him. Another cop came. By the time you knew it, there were maybe 12 guys on this, on this little man. But the thing that I saw was when they had him, they forgot about their responsibility. They became angry. They no longer thought about arresting this person properly, but now they had anger. And when I saw the anger, I saw them. I thought it was like, it was way before Rodney King thing. And they beat this guy. They beat this guy till, and I was the first one on the street. I was running that freeway, so I had every right to be there. 
And I was the first one on there. And I remember standing in the background. I couldn't do anything. I was helpless. They were beaten. Just an innocent man for some reason. I don't know what they beat them. But when they started hitting them with the, the, the sticks and, the, and the, 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 the things that they had, literally, literally, I never saw a body like that. And it reminded me when I was praying about how this man took that beating. Of course, I don't know what happened to him later on. At that time, it was pretty bad. The, my brother-in-law knows that the HPDs in those days were real bad. You didn't mess with them. But the thing about it is this. is This reminded me what they did to Jesus. Legal people that had the right according to their law. But then they were ignorant of that, right? So we find that. Go with me to, let's look at the 23rd chapter. Look at the, are you there at the 23rd chapter? Verse, verse 4. Look at verse 4. And, and uh, then said Pilate to the chief priest. Pilate to the chief priest. To the people. I find no fault in this man. And they were the more fierce. Verse 5. They were the more fierce. Saying, he stirreth up the people teaching throughout all Jewry, beginning from Galilee to this place, when Pilate heard of, Gal of Galilee, he asked whether the man were a Galilean. And as soon as he knew that he belonged unto Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who he himself was at Jerusalem at that time. And when Herod saw Jesus, listen to this, and when Herod saw Jesus, here is a leader, when he saw Jesus, he was exceedingly glad for he was desirous to see him of a long season because he had heard many things of him and he hoped to have seen some miracles done by him. Then they questioned him with many words, but he answered him nothing. Now notice, get this picture now. Here they bring this accused man that is beaten, bleeding now, beard hanging, face probably stretched. And all of a sudden, they're excited to see him. Oh, this is him. This is the one that, that brought all these miracles. But if you study this, they made fun of him. Harold was saying, please, please, please. Let's see a miracle now. Come on. Let's act like I'm going to die and you resurrect me. Let's act like I'm blind and you help me. You see, you see what's taking place now? The ridicule is growing and growing. On. Listen, listen. This is not human-like. This is demonic. This is demonic. This is, this is demonic. Now, now, Satan thinks he has this king in his, in his grip. Now, now, Satan thinks he has it. Satan has no idea what's going to take place next. Jesus did not open his mouth. Again, why didn't he open his mouth? Some people say, you know, if Jesus would have just opened his mouth, he could have been delivered from this. But if he would have been delivered from that, you and I would never be delivered. Do you see the love that he had for us? The love that he has? That's why I serve him with my heart and with my life. I'll serve him the, all the days of my life because what he did for us, no one can ever do what he did for us. No one can ever take the punishment. No one can ever be seated like he took this and was seated as he was beaten. No one. Oh, Jesus. Isn't this awesome? Harold was... Harold at this time and Pilate, they were joyfully seeing Jesus, but they really started mocking him. Some translation says they started playing like children. Charades to the king. Pastor, why are we doing this? Because I want you to see what your king did for us. When you think you can't do it, in worshiping God, think about what He did for you. When you think it's ridiculous when the whole world is doing other things, typically against the stream of the Word of God, think about what He did. When the world starts using Jesus Christ as, as, a, as a cursing word rather than a worship unto Him, and we don't think nothing of it, think about it, what He did for us. You know, what would we do if we were there? What would, what would you do if you were there? If you were where Peter was? Maybe you were not a disciple, but, but he, Jesus healed someone in your family. Or he came. Maybe you were a cousin of the woman that had the issue of blood. Or maybe you were the one that was crippled. 
And yet Jesus came and did that for your family. Wouldn't you be so appreciative with Jesus? And then all of a sudden you find that the rulers, the leaders of the synagogue, my priests, the ones that I look up to, they're beating this man. I'm a little confused. Or would we say, yeah, he should not be calling himself the son of God. I really believe if you and I were there and we saw the notable miracles, the power, there was a part of our heart that would say, no, this can't be. This can't be. This should not be. This should not be. On the other hand, the Pharisees and the Sadducees did this because they were losing people from their church. On the other hand, they, they couldn't do what Jesus did. On the other hand, they, they, they wanted to do all the power that he had. They couldn't. In fact, the sons of Sceva tried to buy this power after Jesus was resurrected from, from Peter. And Peter said, you can't buy this. This is, this is the anointing, the anointing of God. No money can do this. Nothing can do this. Only the love of God. Listen, that same power that you and I have available to us, you cannot buy this. You cannot get this. You cannot earn this. You can just receive it by faith and say, Father, I choose to follow you and I believe your word and I do what you call me to do. There is that power made available to us. Amen, ladies and gentlemen. Go with me to Matthew 27. Matthew 27. Thank you, Father, for teaching us. Matthew 27, the Bible declares again, we find the gospel of this particular disciple. In Matthew 27, verse, verse 24. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. Verse 24, then, Pi then Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing but that rather a tumult was made. He took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. See ye to it. Then answered all the people and said, His blood be upon us and our children. Now release Barabbas. Now that stood out to me. I, I underlined it, verse 25. I underlined verse 25. He answered, all the people and said, His blood be upon us and our children. Then released Barabbas unto them. And when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Now notice this. Who's Barabbas? You know, you know what Barabbas was? A murderer. A thief. A stabber in the back. Barabbas brought hell to the city. But the thing that I see is they rather have Barabbas loose and the blood of Jesus upon them. See, they didn't realize what they said, let his blood be upon us. They didn't realize that truly his blood was going to be upon us. Truly his blood will be upon us. Today we took uh, the, the communion recognizing his blood and his body. Truly that is the blood of Jesus upon us. But they didn't have, they had no idea. You know what they were saying here? They were saying, we want him dead. We want Barabbas. We live better with Barabbas than this Jesus of Nazareth. Let his blood be upon us. Listen to this. Many scholars said that when they released Barabbas, the crime increased more than it was. There was more crime. There was more murder. There was more thievery. There was more bloodshed. And they knew. Think about later on, if you were a father or mother, think about your children today. If you were a parent in those days, knowing that Barabbas was running wild in the streets and you just decided to let Jesus be the one to pay the price and let this murder out. Think about your decision making at that very moment. And here Barabbas is running wild. And here is Jesus now. Jesus going to the cross for us. Right? So we, we know that. We know that picture, right? Now, let's look at John, the 19th chapter. They put Jesus on the cross now. Right? The cross signifies so much. Things happen way before. Remember the, the path that he took to Via Della Rosa, to the place of the skull? That was so much there. That was powerful. That's so much. So powerful that we find this. But notice in John, the 19th chapter, verse 30. 
we find this, and I believe that we're going to stay on here from this moment on. When Jesus, here's Jesus on the cross, in verse 29, there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled it with a sponge of vinegar, and they put upon hyssop and put it to his mouth. This is, this is a form of, of anesthesia. This is just a form to help him. He's in pain. The beatings, the whipping. Listen, Pastor Christine talked about the whipping Wednesday, but let's just talk for a moment about the whipping. The whipping, the, the cat of nine tails. It's a leather thing like a whip. At the end of it had bone, glass, and lead. And when they would strike Jesus, now the Romans knew, the Romans knew how to strike. The Romans were famous for whipping. The Romans were famous for crucifying. In fact, later on we find out Peter was crucified upside down. We find out that they were, they were, they were professionals in this type of, of, of torture. So they put Jesus down. The movies, the movies ha- show pretty close a realistic of what happened, but we're missing something. We're missing something. When the Romans would put a prisoner to be whipped, he wasn't standing. This prisoner was bent over this huge log, tied by his hands to his feet. So you're like, you're like wrapped around this log. Your whole body is wrapped around. And it's almost like in a circular motion, a circular position. Here Jesus is not standing. Here Jesus is not sitting. Here Jesus is not kneeling. Hallelujah. Jesus is not kneeling. All of a sudden, he's tied around this this round thing. And here you have two Roman soldiers that do how to whip. Their, Their specialty was in whipping. So here they get the cat of nine tails. And the Bible says, as they would swing toward his back, it didn't matter. Where they got him, it could have been the back of his head, it could have been his behind his seat, it could have been on his ankles, it could have been on his toes, it could have been... The, Isaiah explains this so well, you could not see who this man was. And so while they're pulling this whip, not only is this whip going forward, but now you find these bones and these, uh, these, these lead pieces and these glass go into his skin. And they pull back. Now notice when they're pulling back, they're not only stripping skin, now they're pulling tendons. Not only are they pulling tendons, they're pulling muscle now. I want you to think about, what if one struck his eyeball and pulled it? Could it, could it be maybe his eyeball would have came out? We don't know. The thing that I'm trying to tell you is, this, and I know it's a graphic thing, but we have to see this. We have to see this to understand. This is Jesus that did it for us. When we feel like we can't do this, think about what he did. When we feel like, I don't feel like going to church, think about what he did. When you feel like, I don't want to, oh, come on, church, think about what he did. This is why we stand before his presence worshiping him, because he did it all for us. Come on, church, hallelujah, amen. 19, John 19, look at John 19. Hallelujah, amen. The Bible says that, verse 30, when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, This concoction, he said it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. The Bible says that he he voluntarily gave up his spirit. The Jews, therefore, being because it was the preparation that the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for that Sabbath day was a high day, besought Pilate that their legs might be broken, that they might be taken away and then we find out that they broke the legs but when they came to Jesus they could not break them right but let me go back to that word it is finished that word it is finished is telestai telestai that word telestai listen that word telestai means it's paid in full now notice this when when if you lived in these days and you took an animal to be sacrificed for your sins for one year as we know and they would cut the bull or the calf, or the turtle dove, or whatever you brought to the fair, to the temple. There was a shout that the Pharisees, that the, the 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 priest would say. The priest would say this in the temple. He would say these exact words: "Telestai." He'd say, "It's finished. It's paid for." But they would say it to the point where they would scream it loud. Where if you were outside the temple, you would hear him say, "It is finished." 
If Jason was to bring a, a calf and ask for atonement, and he brought it to the priest, and the priest took this calf and cut this calf and took the blood and went into the Holy of Holies, then you would hear the priest say, It's finished! At that very moment, Jason would say, Oh yeah, this, I, I'm, I'm, I'm forgiven, I'm forgiven, I'm forgiven. There was joy in Jason's life. There was joy in his family. It was joy in the Gonzalez family that, Oh, he did it. Yes, he did it. But the only thing, it was only for one year. So after that year was over, we would have to prepare again. Now I want you to think about this. Hundreds of years now are going by and your generation is hearing it is finished. It is paid for. Your generation is here. Russell, your generation is hearing this. Russell's an old man now. And now his children are growing and, and their children are growing and they're having and Russell's out there with his with his with his cane, his beard, if he lived in those days, and he heard, It is finished. He would say, Woohoo! Grandson and great great grandson. All right. But don't forget you gotta come another year again. So there was a continuation, continuation of people coming together. Sinji, do you know go get some water, Sinji? Go get some water if you need to. And there was a continuation. There was a continuation, a continuation of things happening, a continuation of things happening. Every year you would have to do this. Every year. Right? And all of a sudden, Jesus now is on the scene. He's on the cross. Now notice this. On the cross. Right before he gives up the ghost. Right before he gives up his spirit. Right before. Listen, ladies and gentlemen. Are you here? Right before he does that, he says... It is finished. It wasn't a shout that a hurting person can do. It was a powerful shout. Some authors, some theologians said this power was so strong from him that it was not an average voice. It was not an average voice that came from a hurting man. It was a spirit call that came from his innermost being to say, it is finished. But notice what he said. The word it is finished is this, is this. Listen to this. It's accomplished. It's fulfilled. It's, it's all over with. It's paid in full. But notice this. If you look at that word, it is finished, he's simply saying finished because the Father requested it. It is finished because the Father requested it. Come on, church. It, it, you know, he saying these things meant so much. Think about it. We find out that Jesus, being a priest unto many, gave his life now. No longer was a priest needed to take the blood of a lamb to the sacrifice. He was the priest. He was the prophet. He was the healer. He was the deliverer. He was the, the giver, the life giver. Now he's on this cross. And the thing that he shouts from coming from heaven Father, it's done. I've accomplished it. I paid it in full for everyone. Then the Bible says he gave up his ghost. Meaning that at that very moment, immediately he shot into the pits of hell. Immediately he went into, into the depths of the earth for you and me. And then the Bible says he was resurrected. That's why we're celebrating that resurrection. But notice this. I want to show you something. Go with me to Colossians, the second chapter. This is where we can't forget. Come on, church. This is where we can't forget. Amen. Amen. Come on, church. Hallelujah. Amen. Colossians, the second chapter. Hallelujah. Oh, the second chapter. Hallelujah. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Pick it up verse 12. Buried with him in baptism, wherein ye also are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God. Verse 12. Who hath raised him from the dead. Jesus. Verse 13, and you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh hath he quickened together with him, have forgiven you all trespasses. Look at your neighbor, I'm forgiven. Say, I'm forgiven, I'm forgiven, hallelujah. Listen to this, blotting out the, tra blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. This is Jesus. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphantly, over them in it. This is, this is the work that he did for us. This is it. 
This is it. The authority that he's given us, this Jesus, this Jesus, this Jesus that we serve today is the powerful Jesus that we can go to the sick and say, Father, in the name of Jesus, you said to lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. There is the power of the resurrection. When we call things in as though they are not, we call things in. And faith says, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Therefore was the earth made without form. God spoke these words. Hallelujah. Amen. This is the same power that we have. See, how can we increase in this power? Ladies and gentlemen, how can we increase in this power? Do you want to increase in this power? How do we do this? By taking his word and living it. Taking his word and believing it. You know, in other words, you have to come to a point in your life that you say, I believe what he did for me rather than the historic books of the, of the, of the world, the secular system world. I believe this word. Hallelujah. Amen. That's why the Word of God, listen, the Word of God will never fail. This Word will never leave you. Oh, you may lose the Bible, but it doesn't mean there's no power in that Bible. You may not want to pick up this, this book, but there's power in there. You know, I've come to the point to understand this is one of the greatest reading literatures ever in the world. Every other Bible, every other l l religious law book has been changed. Every, every religion that you study out there has been changed over centuries, centuries, centuries. But it's something about this book that has never been changed. Oh, it's been, it's been, it's been uh, uh, given different translations. And I love different translations. I love this translation. But I, now that I, I, I have an iPad and computer, I can study other translations. I can find more. But I'll tell you something. This word is forever, forever, ever. Amen. It'll change your life, ladies and gentlemen. That's why resurrection to us is not only his death, burial, and resurrection, but resurrection to us is his death, his burial, his resurrection, and my resurrection now. Your resurrection now. Amen. Hallelujah. Grave cannot hold us. Grave cannot keep us. Go with me to Colossians. Uh, go with me to Romans, the fourth chapter. Romans, the fourth chapter. Hallelujah. Amen. Oh, Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. Bless you. Bless you. Bless you. Bless you. Hallelujah. Amen. Romans, the eighth chapter, verse 14. Hallelujah. Notice what it says here. For as, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For as many as led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Do you see this? Being led by the Spirit of God. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father, Daddy, Daddy, He's my Daddy. He's my Daddy. He's your Daddy, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Now here it is, verse 17. And if children, then heirs of God, and here it is, join heirs, with Christ. I'm a joint heir with Christ. Amen. I'm an heir of God, but now I'm a joint heir with Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Amen. Oh, he's my brother. God is my father. He's my brother. He's my brother. He's my brother. He's my brother. What does that mean, Pastor? You know what? We're family now. My family. I'm in his family. The Jewish says, well, you have to be born of the Jewish blood. Well, according to the word of God, I've been grafted into that branch, which is Jesus Christ. How have I been grafted in? By his death, burial, and resurrection. I received him as my, I received him, I received him as my Lord. Hallelujah. God, Elohim is my father. Hallelujah. Amen. Now I am heirs with him, but now join heirs with Jesus Christ. How is that possible for me to become joint heirs with Jesus? How is that possible? By what he did. He did something so powerful. Amen. Hallelujah. Oh, he's so good. Say it with me. He's so good. Let, let's look at another scripture. Go with me to, uh, let's look at something. Go with me to Hebrews, the, the fifth chapter. Uh, uh, Ephesians, the fifth chapter. Hallelujah. Amen. Ephesians. Hallelujah. Praise God. Let me give me a moment. Let me find it here. Ephesians, the fifth chapter, verse 30. I want you to see this, verse 30. Hallelujah, verse 30. Okay. 
for we are members of his body and of his flesh. Get a hold of this. And of his bones. Wait a minute. Are members of his flesh and of his bone? Okay, let's read. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. Now, I can relate to that. I'm married to Christine. We've been married 36 years. Going on 36, Christine? This June 10th will be 36 years. And it is amazing. Yeah, thank you. And you know, it's amazing. I remember her anniversary in public. Isn't it amazing that I know what she thinks? I know how she feels. When she doesn't say anything, I know what she's thinking. Is, isn't that a miracle? Married couples, you, do, you, do you know what I'm talking about? Has that happened to you? You can read your wife and she can read you. Now, this is yes for you that are bold to say yes. And this is no, if you don't know. Amen. Amen. Isn't it true? I mean, I can, I, I can say, honey, let's go buy this for lunch. She said, oh, my God, that's exactly what I wanted for lunch. I know. Honey, I, 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 I'm going to do this. Oh, that's exactly what I was going to say. Amen. It, to me, it's a miracle. Can y'all say amen to that? It's a miracle. Ladies, if your husbands don't know what you think, then get on them. Amen. And husbands, if you don't, if you don't know what you, if your wife doesn't know what you think, get on them, right? No, no, no. It's a miracle. We can't explain it. it it's unexplainable. There's something about when Christine left her father and mother and joined on to me, he made us one flesh. She's bone of me and flesh of me. It's a miracle. It's hard to explain. Why do we find the enemy so destroying marriages today? Why do we see that? Why do we see the enemy trying to rip apart the flesh? Why? Because it's symbolic to Jesus. Husband, take care of your wife like you would take care of the church of Jesus Christ. Hus wife, take care of your husband because he is the head of the home, not being superior, but being respected under God to lead you into worship. Come on, church. Now, now let's read this. I, I, we, it's amazing how we're, how we're seeing something. For this cause shall a man leave his mother and father. I remember that day that Christine and I became two flesh. This is a great mystery, Paul says. But I speak concerning Christ and the church. I'm speaking Christ and the church. Nonetheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Why? 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 Because he's speaking in relations to the church. When you see a married couple, you see the unity that's it. It reminds us of a church in Christ. Listen, Christine's my wife. I cannot go to her one day and say, oh, here's my ring. I never want to be with you again. I can't do that. That'd be ridiculous. That'd be the worst thing I can ever do. That, that is suicide. That's death. That, that's demonic, right? We can never do that. Now he's saying, I'm not talking about the marriage. I'm talking about in relationship to the church in Christ. How do we love Christ? We love him through the church. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, get a hold of this. If I love the working of God here on earth, which is the church, the, 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 the representation on earth of what God gave his life for, then i got to love the church, the people of the church, the things of the church, the making of the church. You know, somehow we get into the physical of the church, the, the, bo the, the curtains, the carpets, the, the pews. And, it, that, that, that's, that's, not, that's the physical church, but I'm talking about the, the spiritual church. We love each other like we love Christ. When we come to church, we're coming together, not because I want to see your shoes that you're wearing or, or how much law, you know what I'm talking about, I don't know. Maybe, maybe we, some people do that, I don't know, I don't know. Uh, you know what I'm saying? I remember John Osteen one time had a canceled business, meet, business relations in church because everybody was trying to get business at church. Business. Amway, Amway was the biggest thing in church and everybody's coming to church to make Amway sales, Amway sales, Amway. And he had to put a stop. He said, it's not about Amway. It's not about Amway. It's about Jesus. We love Jesus. You see how easy the devil can turn things around for us? See, it's the relationship to the church. And let me show you something. Go with me to 1 Corinthians now. 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter. I woke up this morning and said, Father, there's so much here. I ask you to lead me, lead me, direct me. Show me what you want the people to hear this morning. And I believe we're hearing what he's saying. He's telling us the reason why he resurrected for us. There's more than just, oh, all right, he's on the cross and he died. Oh, no, there's more to this. Today we live it. Hallelujah. Amen. First Corinthians, the 12th chapter. Hallelujah. Amen. Verse 27. Listen to what it says. Now you are the body of Christ. Remember, we're the flesh. We're the bone of Christ. 
the flesh and the bone of Christ. Now you are the body of Christ. Can you see that? Now you are the body of Christ. And members in particular. Very different members. Everyone's different. God has set some in the church, first apostles, secondly prophets, early teachers, miracles and gifts of healing, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. So in other words, he's telling us the church operates in order now. You are the bone, you are the flesh, you are the body, I'm the head, but now the church functions as a moving, moving organism. It operates. Right now we're, we're hearing the word of God. And you're quickened in your spirit because we love Jesus. We hear Jesus. Oh, this morning I got up and I said, Father, thank you that you give me the opportunity to minister to these people. And he said, I can, give you, I can take you anywhere you want. And I said, yes, so you can. But you know what? I'm here and I love you. You love me, right? I, I believe you do, right? I hope you do. Do you guys love your pastor's wife? Amen. Hallelujah. There's more than just saying I love you. There's more than just saying I love you. It's about doing the things of God. Do you know that Jesus died for us? Made, gave us a place of worship. And then he brought two people, one from Chicago, one from California. And we met in Houston. I fell in love with her. The day after I saw her, asked her to marry me two days after I, I met her. Yeah, it's possible. And we're in love, but now we're standing before you bringing you the gospel. That tells me what God's doing. He's got a plan for you and this church. He's got a plan for all of us. Don't forget the plan of God. Don't forget the purpose of coming to worship Him. Don't forget it. I know you may have a headache. I know Sinji's been working all late and tired, and, and uh, we're all tired sometimes, but listen to this. I, can, I, can I brag on Sinji for a moment? I'm going to brag about her. When Sinji first got saved, she worked night shift. Right, Sinji? Give me, tell me if I'm right. She worked night shift. Bo, she got saved first. I believe Bo was serving God, but not so much as you were. You got hold of Jesus. She would come to church on Sunday morning, her and Bo, while she worked all night. And she would be in church in the morning. And I can see she was like this. Of course, I understand it, being up all night, man. But she was determined to be at church. Determined. Now, I'm telling you, I've worked night shift. And let me tell you something. It's so good to sleep nine hours during the day. I can't hardly sleep during the day when I used to work night shift. But Sunday morning. You know why? Because she fell in love with Jesus. And she loved Jesus. And today, that's what we're doing in here. I love Jesus. I love Jesus. I don't care. I love Jesus. When I broke my knee, I literally snapped my knee in half in Hawaii. I was coming to church in a wheelchair. I couldn't miss church. I was in I was in drugs because it was painful. But I wanted to be in church. It was early morning prayer. I'd come. Pastor Christine would just lay me on the ground and my foot was laid out just cry. I, I wanted to be in the presence of God with the body of Christ. Can I say something? Today, we don't take that sacrifice like we should. We don't make that sacrifice. Heard one person say years Ago, our church is too far, and the Spirit of the Lord told me it's about going to Jesus. It's not about distance. Uh, uh, Jesse the Planet said he has he has a family that comes three hours every Sunday and every Wednesday to church, three hours. And I said, Lord, three hours. That's serious. Driving three hours to church on Sunday and Wednesday. Oh, Jesus. You know why? Because that person got revelation. This is the place I'm supposed to be. This is the place where I'm going to worship God. And this is where I'm staying. That's revelation. I remember, uh, I remember uh, my parents, when I was little, we'd go to church. And I remember we would leave in the dark time going to church on Sunday morning. And then we'd get there and it would be daylight when we get out. And I would always think, I was little. I remember that till one day. When my children were all together, we all went to Chicago. 
I drove the same pattern, the same highway that my father drove when we were little. And I told my wife, wow, I didn't realize my dad drove almost an hour and a half to church. And I thought, wow, today, if it's far, we're not going. If it's cold, we're not going. If it's raining, we're not going. If I'm feeling tired, I'm not going. Oh, listen, that's the best time to go. That's the best time to go when you don't want to. That's the best time to go. Come on, church. When you don't want to, that's the best time to go. When you're feeling sick, that's the best time to go. Come on, church. What does that do? Is it making you sacrifice something? No. It's causing you to save body. I love Jesus with all my heart. You're not going to hinder me from, from missing worship. Hallelujah. Let me tell you, if we pass that arena of testing, then it'd be la- less pain upon your body. But Jesus did it all for us. Come on, church. Can you say amen? Hallelujah. Look at look at the sixth chapter. Look at the sixth chapter, First Corinthians. Amen. Hallelujah. Oh Jesus, I told you I'm just gonna be led by the Spirit. I just wanna uh, uh, let's let's take all day long. Amen. At least we got food here. Hallelujah. Amen. The sixth chapter. Hallelujah. Amen. Listen to what it says in verse fifteen. Verse fifteen. Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the member of Christ and make them the members of a harlot? God forbid. God forbid. You know, the church was birthed out of the wound of the side of Jesus. When they pierced Jesus from his side, the Bible says that blood and water came out at that very moment. The church was birthed. You know why? Because according to Genesis, it says that a woman was taken out of the side of a man. And she was made. A woman, which means helpmate. Now notice this. God doesn't do things accidentally. When he made a woman, he opened up the side of a man. So for the church to exist... He opened at the side of Christ. And now the church is born. That's why he's saying, shall a man, when a man cleaves unto a husband, they become one. In Genesis we find that. They become flesh of my flesh and bone of my bone. Listen, Pastor Christine, God made her for me. She became the flesh and the bone out of mine. But now notice this, the church was made for us. We're the flesh. We're the bone. And Jesus Christ was the one that was wounded. That's why we're here today, bringing honor to him. I want you to get a revelation of that. When you bring worship unto the Lord, listen, the church is the called out ones, the ecclesia. I know we're meeting in this little temporary building, but that's not the purpose. The purpose is we're gathered to worship him. I thank you for, for calling, accepting the call to come worship. Thank you. Let me just go further. Thank you for being part of this vision. Thank you. Thank you for being part of this house. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. But it's not about your pastors. It's about Jesus. It's about Jesus. Brought us together. And think about it. He formed us to worship together. Oh, I didn't know Sinji and Bo. I didn't know Keith and Kateri. I didn't know Jeff and Petty. I didn't know Russell. I I didn't know you guys. I didn't know you guys. We didn't know you, but oh my God, Jesus. Think about Jenna. Jesus brought us together in this room to worship Him. You know, people say, Pastor, you're Hispanic. Do you pastor all Hispanic church? I said, why would I? Why would I? You ought to see our church where people of different nationalities, different colors. I tell them, we're a church like heaven's going to be. Hallelujah. Amen. Like heaven's going to be. Hallelujah. Amen. Your pastors get that all the time. Also, where's your Spanish church? I said, why do you say I'm Spanish? I'm Native American. <laughs> I'm Filipino. Amen. People don't know what I am. When they, when I, was in, I was in San Jose. They thought I was Filipino. I was in Alaska. They thought I was Native American. When I came to Oklahoma, they thought I was Native American. They asked me, what tribe are you? I said, well, praise God, the tribe of Judah. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. But see, Jesus did that. This morning, he did that. That's why we celebrate the resurrection. Every time we come to these doors, we celebrate the resurrection. 
We celebrate Jesus. It's about him. He takes this podium and speaks what he wants to. 